My name is Lauren Pang. I've been your health officer for Maui County, living in Maui since the year 2000. A lot of people we have to thank. I think everybody got involved in this lately. The legislature just funding massive amounts, 500 million per year for two years. We have no idea where 500 or 500,000 per year for two years. We have no idea what's Maui's portion, what Big Island's portion. Everything's into play. Kalani English is active in this. Uh, a lot of other people active. Department of Health is active. So it's so much easier. I don't want to name everybody involved, but certainly the big players on Maui is MISC, Maui's Invasive Species, CTAR, which is the College of Tropical Agriculture Human Research, the UH here, in charge of agriculture. Us, Department of Health, the mayor's office, who appointed me as the leader on Maui. Uh, did I leave out anybody? Oh, the School Garden Network, because these are the guys who are trying to eat or instill in kids again the value of growing things and eating it and eating local. So, you know, then all of a sudden they have to get involved because of the slugs. So there's lots of people to thank. I'm going to try to give an orientation. I'm going to speak for 15 more minutes. Now, this might be a little hard to see. Look, there's a problem here. It's called rat lung disease. Rat lung. It's better to remember rat lung than the scientific name of Angiostrongulus cantonensis. Well, what's with the cantonensis? Canton is Canton. I'm originally, my ancestors are from Canton. There's an Angiostrongulus Costa Ricensis. There's a Costa Rican variety and a Cantonese variety of the parasite. The Cantonese variety causes brain and spinal cord infection. The Costa Rican variety causes kind of bad intestinal issues but not the brain one, okay? So the germ comes from, long ago, comes from China, like me, and so does the slug. There's an aggressive, invasive slug, probably comes from Canton area too. I didn't bring it, but it came quite independently of me. The parasite, let me trace the pattern of the parasite for you. They always name where the adult is. The parasite goes between rat, slug, or snail. I'm just going to say slug. I don't want to have to say slug or snail. So rat, slug, rat, slug, rat, slug, rat, slug. It's just going around in this cycle. It has to go through the rat. It cannot go slug, slug. It has to go through the slug. It cannot go rat, rat. So it's going around in its own cycle. The parasite is a worm. It's not. I don't want to confuse the worm with slug and snail. So from now on, I'm going to call that worm the parasite. So it's going around rat, snail, rat, snail, rat, snail, rat, snail. OK, tell me more about this. You kind of have to know this part now. The adult, let's start with the adult. The adult is in the blood vessels of the rat's lung. So it's rat lung. Rat lung means that's where the adult is. It's in the blood vessels. Now, I know this is going to sound like science fiction, but there are stranger things, well, not too much stranger than this. Here's the blood vessel of the lung. It clamps onto the airways, these small airs, and when you breathe, the oxygen comes here and it exchanges with the blood vessel. So this is the interface. I forgot how big the interface is, but when you stretch it out, it's like 20 football fields. You need that much exchange. So the rat adult, the worm, the rat lung worm, the parasite, lays the eggs, it gets through, oh, no, that's okay. It gets through into the airway, it pierces the airway, ouch. I mean, if that happened to me, I'd be coughing up blood. But it's quite attuned to the rat. The rat allows this parasite to live with it together. Because if the parasite killed the rat, that's the end of the parasite. Now it's in the airway. The eggs come up, <coughs> sorry, hatch, and they're coughed up into the airway, up, and it's swallowed. Now, I don't know, but I was pretty grossed out in medical school when I realized the airway is connected to the intestines. So a lot of times you cough up stuff, and you don't want to spit it, 
and you don't have a handkerchief and you <coughs> swallow it. Don't be ashamed to say you do that. We do that involuntarily so many times a day. This guy told me you actually swallow your own mucus like a, a quart a day, just involuntarily. But it's coming up your airway and you're swallowing it. And that's where the, lar the eggs hatched and there's little larva, little worms, very small, microscopic, and it's swallowed into the rack. All right, now it goes to the acid of the stomach, yeah, and it's pooped out in the rat poop. Okay, so the first passage up into the rat poop, now it's rat poop, and it's all over the ground. Slugs and snails eat that. I don't know if they like it, but they eat it. Slugs and snails eat a lot of things, but they seem to eat the rat poop. In the slug, or snail, let's just say slug, okay, it has to go through two more stages. It has to go through those stages. And then it comes out as stage three into the slug. Now what? Well, now that stage three, normally the rat eats the slug and it gets stage three. So it's completed back the cycle to the rat. But when the rat eats stage three, it goes into the stomach acid and instead of being pooped out, it sits in the intestine of the rat and pierces the intestinal wall. Ouch again. I mean, if that happened to me, my stool would be bloody. But it's attuned to the rat. Now, once it comes into the blood vessels drain the intestine, wow, carnival ride. Through the liver, up through the right heart, into, you know, up into the lung. Lung? Does it stop there? No. Back into the left heart, up into the brain, and it goes into the rat brain. Well, I thought you said rat lung. Not yet, we haven't gone back to the lung yet. It's in the brain. And it pierces into the brain, ouch again, but the rat is used to this. Remember, if the rat dies, that's the end of the parasite. Into the rat brain, and when it enters the rat brain, it's about, oh gosh, it's about, let's see. It's real small, like, <laughs> like the size of a pin. But over the next six weeks, it grows to one inch. I know the final growth. The adult is one inch. It started off one hundredth of that, and it grows one inch in the brain. It's wandering around the brain, and then it pierces out of the brain, yeah, goes into the blood vessels, comes back around, and it sits in the lung as an adult. That adult lays eggs. So one adult can lay out hundreds of eggs, and all of a sudden it's multiplying. Everything else, there's no multiplication factor. If the, if the slug ate 10 stage twos, then it's only got 10. If the rat ate the slug and it ate 50 stage three, then it's only got 50. It's only multiplying when the adult worm in the rat lung lays eggs. What a cycle. So you want me to do this real quick? Adult worm lays eggs, comes up into the airway, coughed up, swallowed. The first pass is rat poop. The slug or snail eats that, develops a couple more phases, that's eaten by the rat. The rat gets it the second time, comes into the intestine, pierces the intestine, comes up through the heart and through the liver into the brain, matures to one inch, migrates out of the brain, goes into the blood flow, sticks into the lung, and becomes an adult. What a passage. But this is important to know. It must go through the slug, must go through the rat. Okay. Well, what do we have to do with this? When we eat the, hey, I almost said rat poop. When he, we eat the slug, we can only take that stage. We cannot eat the rat poop stage. That's infected to the slug. All right, so you think, well, it's okay to eat rat poop. For this disease, but there's other gross stuff, you don't wanna eat the rat poop. But for the slug, you gotta eat the slug. Now the slug thinks that we're a rat. The, I mean, sorry, the parasite from the slug, the stage three, thinks we're a rat and goes up and pierces our intestine and it goes up into our brain and that's where it ends. It never passes into our lung, stuck in the brain. And we attack it in the brain. This is not attuned to us. And when we went to attack it, it hurts. It pierces the brain, we attack it, and it hurts. It causes meningitis. Like oh, this horrible inflammation of the brain lining. Many things cause meningitis. This one causes a bad meningitis, okay? So all of a sudden, it never gets out of our brain, and it dies in the brain, 
but when we attack it the inflammation in the brain is horrendous and the physicians they're watching the inflammation in the brain say well i think we should tone down that inflammation it's too much if you have too much inflammation you produce too much fluid and then the brain starts to herniate so the docs have to say give them steroids control that inflammation so you have to titrate it very carefully but in the end you will end up killing all those worms one inch long they don't multiply what you got is what you got but a couple worms can debilitate a kid a small kid and it depends where they went in the brain in the spinal cord the essential centers of the brain i don't know it depends where they went and where they got attacked so uh, okay no so here's us you, you see here's the wow look at that look at that i don't have that long before here's the, the the cycle running between rat and slug rat and slug man happens to get the slug phase hit the next one not only can we get it from the slug next one one more time sometimes the slug it ends up in water and some water animals get the parasite also it doesn't develop in the these animals frogs prawns that's prawns i could have got a better picture of the prawn but that's my daughter's foot these are my prawns and these prawns can hold the parasite not to develop but if you eat raw prawns or you get the parasite from the prawns you got it just like you got it from the slug we'll talk about how to fix that later and then sometimes these slugs you don't eat a slug the slug goes on your produce you didn't see the slug it's very small it can be baby slugs and you ate it now you got the parasite the third stage okay next okay this is a picture well, this is a picture of the stage that infects humans from the slug and this is a certain size okay i'm trying to tell you it's microscopic okay these are red cells drawn to the same <laughs> scale red cells you need a microscope this size of the parasite did i say slug this size of the parasite this parasite you need a microscope so if you say well i'm going to look at my vegetables for the parasite no you're not going to see the parasite you, you if you pay attention you might see the small baby slug which is loaded with this parasite okay next now what's the problem here we always had rat lung disease we always did in 1960 yeah i remember i was like nine years old and my mother says hey you can read read that article we have plenty mollusk african snail cuban snail snails and slugs i can't even identify they always had this parasite always and some people uh, like the foreign exchange students from the east west center they said in their country they eat the african snail and they ate the african snail hey they ate the snail and it wasn't that cooked and they actually got the parasite into the meningitis and they died and my mother said oh look at that don't eat those african snails other times the green berets special forces training in oahu survival they ate stuff it wasn't that cooked they got the parasite they died there wasn't so many cases and it was called intentional you ate a slug or snail and you knew it okay so we always saw some of this because many many slugs and snails carry it at low level all of a sudden there's a new invasive slug come into hawaii it was first reported in 1996 in Oahu, I believe, Waimanalo. 2004, it was reported in Big Island, and Maui reported it in January 2017. Okay, four months ago. Ooh. Now, we had had a couple cases in Maui. In the last 10 years, we had two cases, well, one confirmed and one probably sure, rat lung disease. One from Kihei, one from Haiku. But we always have a low level background, two in 10 years. But now, in the last what, three and a half months, three and a half months, we have like 11 worrisome cases. Some are confirmed. That's not like two and 10 years. And all of these that we saw in the last three and a half months are coming from the East Maui area, okay? So, five years ago, when we first saw our cases, I went to their house and I saw all these other 
kinds of slugs. There were plenty of them. And then I went to the big island because they saw the slug in 2004. And they said, show me the slug. I'm curious. I'm not sure what I'm looking at in Maui. And they looked. They invited me over. And when I went, they didn't have any for me to see. OK. Then all of a sudden, Hana, in the January, starts reporting cases. So I go again to the big island and said, now you got slugs for me, right? Well, yeah, yeah, we got them. We got them. They're in East Big Island. So here they are. I go to my friend's house. Um, and he shows me two in a jar, and he says, now you've seen them, right? And I said, I'm not finished. I'm going to look around your yard and see. I'm going to hunt them. So the first thing I turn over is this flower pot, and there's one, two, three, four, five of the invasive semi-slug. The real name is P. martensi, Parmarian par martensi. I call it martensi. Other people are calling it Parmarian. It's a semi-slug. It's an unusual thing. This is a nickel, I think a nickel or a penny or something. And these are full grown. And what happens is on the back of the slug, you can't see it too well. I mean, it was pretty good, but the light's too bright. There's a muscular pad. And if you kind of bug the slug, there's an opening. It will open up and show you this. I thought it was pus, this yellowish goop. It's not goop. It has a consistency of a grape skin. That is a vestigial remnant shell, semi-slug, semi-what, semi-do snail, I guess. Half snail, half slug, but the shell no longer functions. And then I kind of said, wow, you didn't tell me about this gross part, you know, the, this yellow thing I'm poking. And he said, yeah, well, that's it. This is not a staged picture. I didn't gather them all, pile them up. The first thing I turned over was this. The next one I turned over small, I had two of them, okay? So this is the invasive semi-slug. So I came back, and I go off to Hana, Good Friday. <laughs> just plenty all over Hana. There's some areas with plenty, some areas not so much, some areas not so much in the day, but when you go back at night, wow. So of course they have other stuff, African snail, the old Cuban, you know, that standard one we used to play with, but I used to play with. And then they got this all over. Hana. I did not go beyond Hana. I didn't check in Kipahulu. I didn't check in TNI. I didn't check in Nahiku. Well, I did check in Nahiku. I didn't see any, but I went in the day. And I learned in Hana, even though you don't see any in the day, you go at night. Oh, they're there. This slug carries the parasite at a very high level. 80% of them carry the parasite. And each one is a high level. The other slugs that we always had, like 20%. Furthermore, this slug is really aggressive. It comes out, it really moves, it likes to climb up things, it likes to climb into your, it's not afraid of human stuff. It, it loves cat food, loves dog food, loves your compost pile. And when they invade on the East Big Island, oh, they're everywhere. So sometimes you get these invasive species that just kind of move out. Some of them, they take over. And from reports from the Big Island, since 2004, there's areas and times of the year when it's like climbing up the wall, dropping down onto your food, et cetera, et cetera. But this is the one that seems to carry so much disease, the transmission cycle is more intense, and of course you're gonna spill over to some humans. They tell me from Asia that for every sick person, about 20 people not sick. So not everybody gets sick, but when you say, hey, Dr. Pang, you're looking at 11 cases, Okay, so you multiply that by 20, so you're looking at 200 infections, yeah, kind of, yeah. Big Island says that this parasite will really take out dogs. So puppies eat everything, lick everything, and they track the disease spreading in Big Island by crippled dogs, okay? Okay, so, but, but uh, just for your knowledge, chickens, they eat the slug, they don't get the disease, they don't pass it on. Chickens are good in this aspect, okay? Next, oh, that look, look at that banana. See that banana? So these slugs crawl up everywhere. The coloration to me looks like the brown spots on a banana. And the big island is reporting them in papaya, not the falling kind, the one up in the tree. These things go up and in bananas, okay? And in haliconia and up. So half the time we're looking down, the other half the time you're looking up. Depends if you're looking at day or night. Next, here's the baby of the slug. Wow, look, that's the same, well, that's the same size coin. Really, I think it's a nickel in the other one. 
But look, the baby is so hard to see. It's about the size of the ponytail on Jefferson's hair, I guess. Or maybe his whatever. So, so if you can see this, that's loaded with a parasite. I tell you, my vision's getting bad. And when we clean solid and all, I can't see that stuff, okay? Furthermore, if you cut the end of the lettuce or the long bok or something, you cut into the slug, and that's plenty of parasites. Just the plain slug doesn't put out too much parasites until you cut it. Further, wrap it up, got it. Furthermore, if you irritate the slug, I heard it produces a new kind of mucus, a different kind of mucus, sticky, that's loaded with parasites. So if you're gonna wash your produce with vinegar, that irritates the slug, mild salt, that irritates the slug, mild Clorox, that irritates the slug, you're gonna make the slug produce more, and you have to rinse it off with fresh water again. Okay, next slide. Next slide. This is the final slide for me. So the other part, we're asking people to control your rats, yep. control your slugs. We try to figure out the best way. Wash your produce. And if you're sick, can you please report to the doctors on Maui? They've all been notified, or some of them are terrified, but they've all been notified what we're looking for. What are we looking for? Well, at first it's mild headache, mm -hmm. uh, weakness, yes, maybe a mild fever, not too much cough. Hey, that could be anything, yeah. And then when it gets into the brain, then they get this horrible headache, like a scale of 10 on 10. That's a warning sign to the physicians, something's in the brain, okay? A lot of them, they will go into the spinal column and they get these funny sensations, intense pain on the breeze tingling when there's nothing touching them. That's kind of a sign too. You have to go to the doctor. Why is he gonna treat you? He's gonna to check to level, to measure the level of inflammation to see if we should tone it down in your brain. Furthermore, these same vague symptoms, headache, weakness, maybe a little fever. Hey, maybe it's not rat lung. Maybe it's other things, dengue, Zika. These are public health nightmares, the one that's mosquito borne. They look like that. Maybe it's leptospirosis and typhus. Lepto, you gotta treat it in three days or I think 10% mortality. Typhus, you gotta treat it. We have treatments. But I cannot, a lot of people said, well, it's rat lung, you can't do anything for me. Uh, what if it's not rat lung? What if somebody dies of typhus or lepto thinking it's rat lung? All these things look kind of familiar. And the doctors are, have been notified and they're willing to you know, screen people coming in and we kind of have to. Okay, I'm going to hold your question. I'm going to pass the mic over to Mary Santa Maria, our health educator. Talk a little bit more about control and practical things. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, so we, we are working as a co-op cooperative group with many agencies working on this initiative, but none of it's gonna happen without you. So we really appreciate that you took the time to come and learn, and we really do hope that you'll spread all this information with other folks, take the handouts that we have. We have two more community meetings uh, scheduled, and we're looking at scheduling a third one. There'll be one next Tuesday night in Wailuku, at the community center there, and then on the 8th, there's one in Lahaina at the civic center there. And we are working on scheduling one for Kihei, so um, stay tuned for that. And um, we just wanted to share a little bit tonight what each one of the agencies that are here representative, representing uh, what they're doing. They're gonna share with you a little bit of what they're doing. What the Department of Health is doing is uh, among other things, we're doing these meetings. We're also working with many, we've done many presentations in the community with different groups. We are um, also working at, with the schools, 
we've been doing presentations with the principals and the teachers some of the schools have asked for presentations we're also working on presentations to do directly with the kids that'll be a little more hands-on and fun so that they can get this good information and take it home to mom and dad because we know that's the best way for everyone to learn. So um, we also have with us tonight Lane Huff and Lane is with the uh, School Garden Network and she's gonna be sharing a little bit about what they're doing with the school gardens. Lane. Thank you very much, Mary. Is this mic at the appropriate spot here for hearing? Yeah. Up. How's that? Is that better? Can you hear me now? Thank you. My name is Lane Huff. I am a retired educator who in 2008 decided we needed garden programs and to reconnect to the INA. And it has been an amazing experience. We have 8,000 children involved in garden learning right now on the island of Maui. And we have 40 schools with active garden programs and five more that are coming on board, probably within the next either year or two. How many of you are parents of children going attending schools on this island right now? All right, and principals. Excellent, thank you. All right, so uh, first thing I want you to know is that we have a best policies, best practices policies for our garden programs. They have to be posted inside the gardens. These comes come from the College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources. It's a 19-page document on best practices for school gardens and school garden learning. And we have derived this poster from that source. Here's the poster. It is on a table and available for you to look at afterwards. So this is for all of us to follow common rules. This is used throughout the state of Hawaii. Second for you to know is that we communicate with each other from island to island and therefore our garden coordinators through our island directors have been communicating with the Big Island about rat lungworm disease for the past three years. We did not know when or if it would come to Bali, we had hoped it would not. Nonetheless, we feel as if we have some knowledge of what this is and how to do something about it from our Big Island uh, colleagues. So in January, unbeknownst to us that semi-slug was on the way to Maui, we had a training, the notebook is on the table, with our garden coordinators on uh, food handling and garden safety. This notebook includes information on rat lung disease. And inside this notebook is a copy of a second grade workbook specifically on the semi-slug uh, and its involvement with rat lung disease. The title of it is The Mystery of Rat Lung Disease. And you can actually download this booklet and you can, all you have to do is just by your name where you signed in, say I want the link to the book. Good enough. And we will make sure you get the link and you can download it yourself so that you're able to talk with your children or your grandchildren about what this is. This is a second grade reading level. However, it can be used for K education. So it's a very valuable resource to have at home and to talk with your child about and to practice some of the techniques that are mentioned. We in our schools and our school gardens are practicing uh, the uh, snail trap and the slug jug. So we are able to right there in the school garden through using best practices and that includes gloves, it includes closed toed <laughs> shoes, and it includes this. This is a tongue. So this is a tongue with a gloved hand that can touch a snail and put it in with the observation of the teacher and the garden coordinator in the slug jug. Then we're going to be sending information to Maui Invasive Species Committee. And by the way, mahalo to all of the people who are presenting tonight, Department of Health and CTAR and MISC and, uh, I said, did I say everybody? Oh, and Department of Agriculture too, because their farm to school coordinator actually lives in Makawao for the state. So she has been extremely helpful, Robin Fall, in giving us information. You're welcome to talk with me afterwards, and I will have my cards available for you as well, Mahalo. And we have next speaking. Yes, Misk.
evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Adam Radford. I'm the manager of the Maui Invasive Species Committee. So thank you for taking the time to meet with us this evening and talk about this important topic. Um, so what MISC is doing is we're supporting efforts to find out more about where semi-slug may be. So this came up earlier, but really like you're our greatest ally in, in figuring that out because that's actually how semi-slug was discovered in East Maui was a resident that said, oh yeah, I see that in my yard. Here's a picture of it. It was like, oh, okay, now we're looking across Maui. So if you have suspect slugs, we encourage you to take pictures. That's actually the best way for us to help you identify what you have. Um, so that's one of our main tasks. The other is outreach and education. So we're all really working on parallel tracks to inform the public and answer questions you may have and provide resources to you. And one of the resources we actually have is um, it's a uh, part of our Hoike Ohaleakala curriculum, which is a, a multidisciplinary uh, science-based program um, that's rooted in Hawaii. So it's really you know based on our natural environment here, but we actually have a lesson in that curriculum that may be of interest to some of you here. So if you're interested in those things or we can provide resources or answer questions for you, please feel free to contact us. Um, you can just email mistpr at hawaii.edu or call our phone number, which is 573-MISC. So thank you again for your time and for all of the efforts of the different organizations really working cooperatively to address this problem. So, thanks. Thank you, Adam. So what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, hear from Lynn Nakamura Tingong from CTAR, uh, and she's going to share a little bit more in detail about how to prevent the transmission of this infection. Aloha, everybody. Good evening. Um, I have a presentation, but I think I'll just go off of my handout. Um, this has been an updated handout. I am trying to include as much current information and up-to-date information on my handout. It's um, at our uh, table over there, the CTAR table. I apologize. I, I, I think I killed the copier making copies, um, but this will also be up on our website and I will be uh, providing these at all the additional community meetings. Um, so I want to begin with that um, effective management of slugs and snails is really a multi-pronged approach, that there's no one silver bullet for killing these things. Um, the other thing that I wanted to emphasize, some people brought up, well, you don't really, you're not really talking about rats, which are also part of the problem. Um, they are, and we do want to control the rats. Um, but rats, we know, are already a health hazard, right? We know that we don't rot, want rats around our food. We don't want them in our restaurants. We don't want them on our farms. We don't want them in our gardens. We don't want them in our houses. Um, and the Department of Health has an excellent handout um, with um, management strategies for controlling rats. Slugs and snails have traditionally been a garden pest, right? We've had them in our yards. Um, you know, we take off the leaves if we see a slug or snail on it. It hasn't been anything like a health hazard that's keeping us from, um, you know, eating it. Uh, so now we have an extra concern now with the slugs and snails, and so we have to have uh, some extra management and precautions taken when we're dealing with snails and slugs in the yard. Um, so the first thing is, uh, and as mentioned earlier, uh, we're kind of focused on a particular uh, slug, which is the semi-slug. So the first thing is going into your yard, uh, particularly in the evening, and looking for this slug, seeing if it's present in your yard. Um, of course, remember, all slugs and snails can carry the parasite, so we don't want any, you know, we don't, uh, you want to try and get rid of all slugs and snails, but in particular, we want to be looking for this slug. Um, this semi-slug has some interesting behavior that's a little bit different than your regular snails and slugs in that it likes to climb things. It's been found in papaya trees, it's been found in bananas, um, it climbs up drain pipes. So we have to be extra vi vigilant with even looking up vertical sides, right? You're going to want to be looking up in trees um, and looking up in your, uh, your fruit trees and up your drainage pipes to see if you have evidence of this slug. Uh, this semi-slug also really likes plastic. Um, so talking to some people that have experience um, in managing this on the Big Island, they said they found, usually found this semi-slug under plastic, like if you're using it as a weed mat or under um, plastic containers or uh, containers like, you know, your plastic pots. Um, they also don't like to make a lot of contact with the soil. They'll move across the soil, but when they're at rest or when they're, um, 
you know, seeking refuge, they're going to seek somewhere where they're not touching the soil. So that's why they like to hang under things, okay? And this is going to be key when we're looking at different um, management and trapping strategies. So the first thing is really understanding, um, understanding the pest. On the handout, I also provide, there's a, a picture of that semi-slug. It was described earlier. It's got a, um, a residual uh, shell that's kind of yellow. As somebody, sometimes it has um, folds of skin covering that, though. So it kind of looks like it has a, a hump on its back. And then the eggs are clear. They're, uh, they're transparent. And they're about 2.5 2 millimeters in diameter. So you would want to get rid of those, too. You want to get rid of the eggs um, and any babies that you see around the eggs. Does somebody have a question? Uh, yeah. We get uh, slugs all over the island. And we use salt. And that will kill a lot of the slugs that's around. And, uh, Yes, I'm, I'm going to get to some of the controls. Um, salt can, but salt can also kill a lot of other things. And it can also poison your plants. So if you're trying to control snails and slugs in your garden, you want to be careful with the use of salt because it'll change your soil profile and it can poison your plants as well. Okay. Um, so moving along, some of the things that you can do is manage your growing environment. Um, these are just going to be reducing those places where snails and slugs can hide. Okay, so picking up that debris. Um, last night I was saying sanitation, sanitation, and sanitation. Um, just, you know, keep your yards uh, clean and neat. Um, pick up debris, pick up rotting fruit, anything that these things are going to want to feed on. And particularly look, look under things like under boards, under pots, under weed mat. Um, I was also talking to someone that they really, um, they can, you can find them in mulch. You know, people who are using cardboard as a mulch to, to manage their weeds, check under that cardboard because a lot of times the slugs will get in under there, okay? And so you may have to reconsider using cardboard in your yard if you have a high slug population. Okay, um, also you know, your pets can get sick, so we're recommending that you pull your pet dishes in at night uh, because the slugs will, they like to feed on the pet food and your, um, your pets can also get sick from the, from the slug parasite. Um, so we're recommending that you remove your pet dishes at night. You can also put some barriers. I'll talk about some barriers that you can put on your pet dishes as well. Um, and then the other practice is slugs and snails love a moist environment. So uh, just, you know, if you're watering and irrigating, make sure you're irrigating or watering in the morning so that most of that evaporates off during the day and you don't have a soaking wet field or garden at night, okay? So try to reduce the moisture at night. I know in some places it rains a lot and that might not be possible, um, but basically if you can control the moisture in your environment, the better. Um, the other thing too is if you're gardening, <clears throat> and I, I want to... I really do want to emphasize that I want to still have people growing things in your yard, you know, and, and growing um, produce for your family. Um, so you can grow vegetables. The idea is that you basically want to grow the things that are going to be susceptible to um, slugs and snails in a protected area. Make that place as snail and snug, snug, slug proof as possible, okay? So put barriers around it, put traps around it, use the baits if you're comfortable with using the baits around it. So that you create this snail, snail and slug proof, or not proof, but snail and slug free area. And then that's where you want to plant your most susceptible uh, vegetables and um, produce, okay? Um, in hard to manage areas where you don't think you'll be able to manage that, then grow something else that you're not going to eat, okay? Um, they Let's see, moving along, one of the best control measures for slugs and snails is to actually just remove them, physically remove them, okay? So um, one of the things that we're recommending is that, where did my gloves go? I have too many pockets. I have lost my gloves. Anyway, you want to have gloves on, and then you can designate some tongs. Notice we have tongs, and they say slug use only. I like to use actually disposable chopsticks, because then I just throw out the chopsticks, and then there is no confusion that these tongs will be used for anything else. Okay, so you have your tongs. Where did my, I swear I had gloves. <laughs> Lynn gave me gloves. Um, 
but you wear your gloves, you have your tongs, you go out at night. So the slugs like to come out at night. They're nocturnal and they like it moist. So if there's an area that you're trying to hunt in, you uh, want to irrigate it, kind of water that area. Then you're going to go out with your flashlight. You're going to look for the slugs. When you see one, you're going to pick it up and then you're going to put it in your slug jug, which can be any type of container. I use a recycled yogurt container for my slug jug at home. And that's also well labeled. Make sure it says for slugs only. Okay, and then in that slug jug, um, you want to put a saline solution, a really salty solution. And it's going to be seven parts water and one part salt. This is all in the handout. That's a salty enough solution. It's going to kill your slugs, but it's also going to kill the parasite. You need to leave the slug in there for 48 hours for it to kill the parasite, OK? Um, so what I advise is that you have a slug jug on hand. You also want to have a lid, because it'll probably smell a little as the slugs start to die. Um, but you just go out every night, and you hunt for slugs. And when I was talking to a farmer in Hana, he was able, he said the first night he went out in his kalo patch, they went, for, it was like an hour and a half, him and another buddy, and they picked out the slugs out of their kalo patch. The second night he went out, it only took them 10 minutes to collect their slugs and snails from their kalo patch. And so every night he was going out, it's less and less and less. So you can make a significant impact on the population of your slugs and snails um, just by going in and being diligent, diligent about removing them. And then once you feel like you've hit a plateau, maybe you're only getting one or two a night, you can kind of pull back a little bit, put your traps out um, so that you can monitor if they're increasing again. Okay, so physical removal is really important. The next one are some traps. Uh, the traps are good because it, they're gonna be trapping and killing the the slugs and snails, but they also allow you to monitor the population in your area, okay? The key with the traps is that you wanna do, you wanna do several of them, uh, cause they're only good for probably a few feet around that trap. So you wanna have several traps spaced around your garden and spaced around your area so that you can um, monitor the area better. Um, there's lots of traps. I, I like Googled um, slugs and snails. There's lots of traps out there. Um, you can get commercial ones or you can make your own. Um, the beer traps are quite popular and they do work. You just have to make sure that they're covered so that they don't get watered down. Um, and also you wanna have them, you, you wanna have it so that uh, one, dogs or other things can't get into it because again, you don't want your dogs going in and drinking beer that has dying slugs with a parasite in it, okay? So you wanna make sure that the sides are deep and that it's covered so that the rain can't dilute the beer. Um, and then you wanna empty, you wanna get rid of those slugs, put them in your saline solution so they, they die and the parasite dies and make sure that you're replenishing those traps on a regular basis. Um, you can also use board traps. I have an example of a, mel a melon rind tra uh, trap on here. Basically, uh, the board trap works really nice. It's a, a, just a two by, you can do a two by two um, piece of wood with some runners underneath. And the dark, moist area underneath the trap will attract the slugs and they'll go in and they'll hang under the trap. And then in the morning, you just scrape those slugs off into your slug jug and uh, you can trap and kill the slugs that way. Um, also, uh, uh, Lynn always reminds me that if you are not comfortable with the saline solution, you can also freeze your slugs in a Ziploc, maybe double ziploc bag in your freezer, um, and you can freeze them to death as well for 48 hours, if you're comfortable with that, or you had a dedicated freezer for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is barriers. So um, another thing that's quite popular on the internet, uh, the copper strips have been found to be pretty effective. The key with the copper is it needs to be wide enough. If it's not wide enough, it's not going to be enough of a deterrent for them. Because basically the slugs and snails, they'll go across the copper and they get a slight electrical charge from it. And um, if it's too short, 
So if it's thin enough, they'll just go over it because it won't be enough to deter them. So it's got to be wide enough. Um, first, I was recommending two inches, but I talked to somebody on the Big Island. He said, no, make it four because <laughs> um, these slugs are big. The semi-slugs are five centimeters long when they're adults. So um, I, would, I would recommend four inches. Um, you can use the copper as a way to kind of barrier, uh, make a like you know, a barrier around your raised garden bed or around container pots, around your pet dishes. You can buy it as a tape. You can buy it as sheet metal. Um, most of the copper, though, I haven't found any on island, so you probably have to order it. Um, the other thing that I saw that was really cool was that uh, somebody put wire around their raised bed and attached a 9-volt battery to it. <laughs> and it's on, it's on uh, uh, YouTube, and um, you can see the snail, it, the slug and snail won't, won't go over that, that line. The, the, the one thing that you have to keep in mind with the barriers is they are barriers. They're not going to kill the slugs and snails, so they're not reducing the population. They're just keeping the snails and slugs out of the places where you don't want them. So I advise doing both a trap and a barrier you know, we're using trap, bait, and barrier because you want to reduce the population of the slugs and snails in your yard as well, in your area, okay? So, um, let's see, the last part are the baits, okay? So, uh, baiting is most effective when you use it uh, late in the afternoon, early evening, because the snails and slugs, that's when they come out. If you put it out early in the day, you're, you're not you're not targeting the pest, um, and your bait could go to waste. So you want to make sure that you're applying it when it's most effective, which is late afternoon and evening. You want to irrigate before you apply the bait, because basically you want to attract the um, you want to attract the slugs and snails to the bait. Okay, so you want to irrigate the area, make it nice and moist, the exact environment that they want, and then put the bait there. And that's where they're going to go for it most. Okay, and, and if you have your traps about, you'll know where your slugs and snails are. Um, I also saw a combination of traps and bait. So somebody had a board bait, I mean, sorry, a, a board trap, and then underneath that board trap, they put they put bait, okay? So that was like a, a double way to, to catch, the, catch the snails and slugs. You don't want to pile or mound your bait because some of the baits uh, are, can be toxic to pets and you don't want to mound them because it makes it more attractive to the, uh, to the pets when you do that. Um, so the, I'm gonna talk about three, um, actually two categories of, of pesticides um, and then I'm also gonna hand it over to, nope, Okay, <laughs> change, change of plans. I'm just gonna talk about two main categories of baits. I wanna advise that with the pesticides, you need to read the label. We have two lists of pesticides that have been approved by the Hawaii Department of Agriculture to be used here in Hawaii, one for home and home gardens, and the other for commercial agriculture. Uh, you want to make sure, I can't emphasize enough, the label is the law, Please follow the directions. In particular, you want to look that it's approved for the crop, it's approved for the pest, and that you have the right rate. You're applying it at the rate that it says on the label. Okay, so the two main baits, the most common one that people are maybe are most familiar with is a metaldehyde. Um, this was discovered, I think, early in the 1930s. It's a former a fuel, it was a fuel, source of fuel for camp stoves, and it was like this, metaldehyde tab and they would use it for their fuel stoves and they noticed that when they left it out, snails and slugs would eat it and then they would die. So they started using it as a bait. Um, it's come a long way with several different formulations and so there's a bunch of different formulations and different ways to um, apply this product, but the main thing is that it, it kills the snails and slugs fairly quickly so you should see dead slugs when using this type of bait, um, or at least the um, some evidence of death. Um, however, this bait is very poisonous to dogs and should not be used around pets or children. So if you have pets or children in the area or other mammals, I do not recommend using this. Um, uh, you also want to avoid getting this on plants, especially after they have the edible crop of the plant growing. So the metaldehyde might be best used as a uh, 
something that you would put around the perimeter of your yard um, if you know that no pets and children will be in that area or if you're a grower you would be putting it on the more of the perimeter not directly into your crop um, again check the label for the application guidelines the other category are those that are certified for organic use and that is the um, iron phosphate um, and then there's also a new one that's come on the market, which is sodium ferric EDTA. Well, you would want to check to make sure that that's labeled for organic. Um, but basically, this, uh, the iron in these baits causes the snail and slug to stop eating. And, um, and so what happens is they'll die several days later. The challenge with this bait is that you don't always see them die because it takes a while for them to die. Although I, I have seen people who, I have talked to people who have used it and they said like especially with the African snail, they'll see the empty shells so they know that it's working. Um, this, this bait is safe to be used around gardens, ornamentals and fruit trees and um, uh, is safe to use around pets and children. Um, but again, I recommend reading the label before and always wear protective gear when you're using any type of pesticide. Even if it says natural, always wear gloves um, and use proper handling procedures when you're handling them. The last thing that I just want to say is if you are using both um, the barriers and repellents, the copper, with your baits, make sure that they're not together because if you put the baits with the copper, they're not going to get to the baits because they're going to be repelled by the copper. Okay, so you want to use those separately. But you can use the traps with the bait. Okay, I think that's everything. Uh, should I take questions now? <laughs> no, no questions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, if you do have questions, please come to me after and also um, to, if you want to, to get this handout. Thank you so much. Aloha. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, you got more about slug control than you thought. So what I wanted to talk to briefly about was what you need to do in the kitchen. One of the things that we're focusing on when we, we're trying to respond to what are the issues with the rat lungworm disease is that everybody has a place and a role in terms of um, keeping our food safe. So you, I know, are all consumers, and that's one of the groups that I work with. So as consumers, there's things that we can do to make sure that what we're con the produce we're consuming is safe to eat. Um, we have one handout here that kind of addresses some of the consumer as well as the garden issues in terms of keeping things clean. So just out of curiosity, how many of you actually wash your hands before you start preparing food? Wonderful. How many of you wash your produce before you start preparing it? How many of you have been doing this for the last month? Oh, okay. You're an exceptional group. Most of the time when I ask that question, they're, they're, I'm lucky if I get half the, half the room that's saying that they wash the produce. That's a key piece of responding to this situation so we can continue to eat produce making sure that we're washing our produce. So like anytime you're in the kitchen, you want to make sure that you're washing your hands and your surfaces first. Then when you're washing the produce, what you want to do is make sure that you're looking and separating out the pieces. So something like a, like a broccoli, you know, it's clumped together. So, you know, there's things that can get in there. So you want to open things up, separate the portions, the leaves, wash them singularly. And you want to wash them under clean running water. Okay, I know some people have used um, lemon or vinegar or some other kinds of um, additives with their wash water, but our studies have shown that that doesn't buy you any additional benefit for this particular parasite. Okay, it might work in other ways in terms of helping remove debris and other things, but in terms of killing this parasite, that doesn't do it. Okay, the best that we're wanting you to do is to remove the parasite by doing a good job washing your produce. So for some of you, it's a matter of looking. Like I know for people who are active in the garden, you kind of know what pests look like, so you know what you're looking for. A lot of people who aren't garden enthusiasts or entomologists, those kinds of people, it's a little more difficult. So you may not see it, so wash anyway. Even if you don't see it, wash anyway. So we're recommending like a twice wash. And if you look at this handout, it kind of speaks to that. You want to rinse thoroughly under clean running water, okay? 
So the other way that you can deal with the parasite is you can cook it. So you're cooking it to 165. Now, am I gonna cook my papaya to 165? Maybe if it's green and I'm making chicken papaya, right? But am I gonna cook my leafy green to 165? Mm, maybe, but sometimes probably not. Some people like it fresh. So there's different techniques you can use for different kinds of produce. The other thing that we're, we're, is an option for you is if you freeze it. Again, not all things work well with freezing. I, but freezing is an option to kill the parasite. You wanna make sure that you're freezing for at least 24 hours so it's solid. If it's a, if it's a thin item, it'll obviously freeze more quickly. So that's another option. Don't stop eating, just use one of, the, one of the techniques to take care of the parasite. Now, some of these, par some of these techniques may be contradictory to other things you might have learned about how to deal with pathogens in your food. Most other bacteria, if you freeze it, it does not kill it, okay? But what we're talking about is technique specific to deal with this rat lung parasite. I just want to make that clear because some of you, if you've been studying or, or, or paying attention to what are good food handling practices in the kitchen, they'll tell you freezing does not kill the parasite or the pathogen. But for this particular one, we are saying that it, you can use that as an intervention technique. Okay? So the other thing that you want to have handy in your kitchen as you're doing this is to have a brush that will help you with some of your cleaning. The other tool is to have a thermometer, okay, because that's how you'll know that you're cooking to temperature and you want to get to that 165, which is the internal temperature, okay? All right. We always try to have at these meetings a patient because some people will tell you it's so rare. Well, it's not that rare. And then if you actually got the disease and it can be quite bad, it could be long term. So we have a patient from Maui. Her name is Trisha Miner. You might have read about her in the papers. She's going to tell you about what happened. But more importantly, her father will speak also, because sometimes when the patients are kind of out of it, it's the parents who see what happens and the biggest worry of all. So there's actually quite a few patients, 50 on the Big Island over the last 12 years, and six at least on Maui now, and maybe a few more. Uh, Trisha is from Maui, but she got it from the Big Island. We're not playing this game. We could have people who got it on Maui too. Well, we're not trying to blame one place or another. So, um, okay. Um, always remember, we're not sure exactly in Hawaii, for every sick person sick enough to go to hospital, how many more are out there? The people from Asia tell us for every sick person, there's probably 20 more out there. We're not sure what's going on in Hawaii. Okay? So we are planning to look. Trisha is a very wonderful speaker, school teacher, no school teacher, so she'll be right on. Um, aloha, my name is Trisha, like they said. Um, I'm a preschool teacher by trade, so my love for children, I love children, and so when I um, started thinking about if I should speak out, um, I was concerned about, you know, the farmers and what can do to my, the economy of Maui, um, but I started to think that if we get more people like me, we're going to have more cases like me, and having to raise money for deal with cases like me, and then they're gonna have the farmers. So I had to really think about how I was gonna share, share and what I want to share my story. Um, I wear my glasses, um, I, not all the time, um, because my eyes are very sensitive to light. Um, when I initially got it, I thought I had the flu. Some of you might have read my story over on civilbeat.org, and it, um, it was hard for me to write that story um, to explain to people about the pain. Um, when I first got it, like I said, I thought I had the flu, so I'm a workaholic. So I, I was working back and forth on, in, on the Big Island, living in Waimea, doing my job. And I went over to Hilo and I had a salad um, on a Thursday, and I came back to Maui and I felt like I had the flu. 
Um, still went back to work on Monday, because I'm a workaholic, love what I do with my preschoolers. And then by, two, by Monday afternoon, I started feeling like I, I got the flu. So I decided to um, stay home and um, went to the doctor to get the Tamiflu pill so I could get better and go back to work ASAP. Um, I thought I had an allergic reaction to the Tamiflu pill. Um, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't have um, anything touch my body at all, um, meaning not even the breeze. Any type of wind that would touch my skin, um, I would cry. Um, I would have to sleep at my bar counter in my house with my hands like this, standing, um, because anything that would touch my body would hurt, and I'm not exaggerating at all. I had to shut all my windows in my house because of the, the wind, the sound, and the light. That's how bad the pain was. Um, so then I went, went back to work because that all of a sudden those symptoms kind of died away. So I went back to work. And then what happened was in my right foot, I lost sensation in three of my toes. And um, it felt like somebody dropped a giant piece of luggage on my foot and they just left it there. So I actually um, called my foot my saving grace because I kept going back to the doctor and saying, hey, something wrong with my leg and I travel a lot and so please help me. So we started looking at anti-inflammatories for my leg. By the second day, which is three days it takes for the anti-inflammatory to work, and it didn't work by the second day. Um, within three minutes, the doctor had a feeling that I had this disease because of how I continued to explain to him the symptoms. And so I was admitted into ER with a pressure of 203 over, one eight, or over 128. Um, so my pressure was going and the headaches that you get, um, I'm a migraine person, I get migraine, so I understand that. Um, but this was migraines times 22. And it was all on one side of my head, the pain. And um, they took me from any type of painkiller to trying to put me on morphine and it wouldn't stop the pain. Um, so the, the pain, um, they had to put me in isolation because they didn't know what type of um, if it, meningitis they thought because once you go into this red lung disease, it turns into a, what you call parasitic meningitis. So that's what I have now. Um, I had to be in what I called my Dracula's den because I couldn't stand light, so it was pitch dark. And if you've ever been in a room with isolation, it has two doors um, for isolation. And be, from those two doors, I could actually still hear um, people's feet sliding on the ground outside. That's how sensitive my ears and my eyes were. So I pretty much lived in darkness. Um, I mentioned in the article that I wrote that with the pain that I had, and I'm a mother of three, um, I would go through labor again and eat an ice cream and feel like it was nothing compared to the pain that I, that I felt. And that was my concern. Um, when I looked at the pain that I went through, my concern was um, the children, um, pregnant moms who could lose their babies, um, single parents who would not be able to take care of their children, and our kupuna who's going to take care of them. So knowing all of that is when I chose to say, you cannot have shame and you gotta speak up. So that's when you saw my big swollen head on Channel 2 News, <laughs> which I did not expect that that was gonna happen. And my biggest push now is awareness, and it's not awareness to fear eating vegetables or to plant the garden um, or to be against the farmers or to point fingers. It's about trying to figure out how to do it safely. I'm an educator like me. Um, Dr. Peng mentioned, and my concern is we talk a lot about the farmers. Well, if we think about the educators in the schools, we have science teachers who are teaching our children. So my concern now is how are they getting educated to protect our children when they're in school, starting gardens. So um, I kind of have a big mouth, so 
I push myself all over and I invite myself into conversations with this because my concern is about the children and about our community. Um, I'm a Hana girl. And so what I've been doing is I've been realizing that um, we don't have resources out in Hana. I'm blessed that I lived here on this side and I have my parents to take care of me and I'm going to ask my dad to come up soon. But every day um, I've said scriptures and codes of goodness to those people out in Hana who don't have resources because you live every day off of painkillers. That's your breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And um, that's not a way to live. Um, so I try my best to get them to, to be positive and not to be sad about it, um, to look at it as a blessing because now we get to educate people and to help the children. So f for me, is um, trying to get people to stop fearing it, to learn about it, to be aware, and to just learn. You gotta share. If you find something that worked for you, like that nine volt battery thing, <laughs> share it. Share it with each other because we gotta help each other. And before I call my dad up, um, you'll notice that I tremor. Um, part of the pain is there's a lot of tremor. I got sent to the ER once, thank you Jesus. Um, but a lot of it is body tremors that you can't control. Um, they give you all these pills to try and control it. My parents watch me tremor. Um, I fall at often times because of the pain um, that I have and the lack of um, balance that I go through. So um, that's me, but it takes a lot for my parents. They have to be with me 24 seven, and I'm a very independent person, so it drives them crazy. So, but I'd like my dad, um, who's my nurse, to come up and, and, and share. This disease is something that's so unusual that we've only gone through five or six weeks with Trisha having this. One week, she was totally in the hospital, incapacitated. Uh, she got to a point with drugs, uh, opiates and Valiums and whatever they have to ease the pain, to a point where she could be released but needed 24-hour care. And a lot of you have gone through care, uh, maybe with your loved ones for a heart attack or some other thing. My wife had triple bypass. This is nothing compared to that. Taking care of someone where you know the progression of the recovery this you don't know. This can be a year. Uh, Trisha has gotten so much better. Uh, <laughs> you see the tremors. This is nothing. Uh, a week ago, she, we had to take her to the hospital in the middle of the night because the tremors were so bad. She was total. Her whole body shaking. Had a migraine or the more than migraine headaches that could not be controlled with. Uh, any of the uh, prescription drugs that the doctors are, have her on now. So that can happen any time. We thought, well, she's doing good. And then all of a sudden, the parasites, whether they move or whether they're di hopefully dying off and this is a reaction, it's hard to understand what's happening. She will have good days and bad days. Uh, certainly the uh, medications that she is on controls the pain and controls the sensation of shaking. Today she had a, t a day where she went and got IV drip solutions. Um, and so it's a pretty trying day for her to come, even come out here tonight. Uh, so the thing to understand is uh, it's a strange disease and the doctors, I don't quite know myself what's going on. Uh, I don't quite know what's going on with the parasites. Uh, I was in Costco and someone behind me because I had bought some cool strawberries said, oh, are those from Maui? And I said, yes, they are. And they said, well, you know what's happening? I said, yes, my daughter has rat lung disease. And they were taken aback that I would be buying local product. It's not the product that's a problem. It's, again, how we handle the product. So I think I'm glad the news is getting that out, the health department is getting that out, and I thank them for uh, sharing Trisha's story with you and 
hopefully you can understand what this is and be a little more aware of how to treat not only for this disease but other diseases through sanitation practices. Uh, we've, we're lucky that we're at an age that we can help her out. Uh, it is a 24 hour. Uh, she has get, gets up in the middle of the night, her equilibrium, equilibrium going to the left. If she turns to the left without thinking too much, she will fall over. She's fallen out of bed. And she, you know, she doesn't share some of these with everyone, but I will because this is what you're looking at with this. You don't know. The pain is there, the tremors are there. How your body is reacting is wherever the parasites decide, I guess, to hit your nerve sensations. You sometimes have trouble breathing. All of this, I think, is pretty, some of this is in the, the, the brochures, but not all of it, of, of what you're going to face if this, this happens. Again, it's rare, so there's not a lot of research. They don't know what to do. We feel her doctor is on the right path. He's doing a lot of things that other doctors maybe are not doing, or people that have this don't know or don't have the support of friends, family, to really be able to be on top of it. Uh, Trisha has a lot of friends that come by and they help us out and help her out and then get educated at the same time. So meetings like this and people talking about this is something that has to be done and it's not just with this it's a, you know there's more diseases out there than we know of and this is just one that has come about just recently but the, we can control a lot of what happens to us and i think that's what trisha wanted to do when she was contacted by the media and again she does care for children that is where she comes from teaching and that direction has taken her on to the path she's on right now to try and educate people, even though it's people, there's friends of hers in HANA that have this disease that don't have as much support as she does. And she's trying to pass on the knowledge that she's gotten from this to those people to hopefully get them on the same course. Uh, some of them are doing worse. Some of them are doing better certain days. And they have their ups and downs too. Trisha's maintained a positive outlook on this and tried to do things she can. It's tough. You, you've all been sick and it's tough to keep a positive a mental outlook on, on things that are happening to you. My wife and I have, uh, as I say, we're lucky that we can take care of her. We're lucky to have friends of hers and ours that will help also. So it isn't just the person that has rat lung disease, it's your whole family. And it's the same thing on any disease that comes about that you all have maybe taken care of someone in your life. And normally you know what to expect. This one, you, it, it's, we don't know what to expect. We don't know long term what damage might be done to her memory. Uh, certainly in a heart attack, you can have some loss of memory. This one, she may or may not. She may or may not regain her motor skills. So it's a day-by-day -day thing. And I don't want to be down on this disease, but that's the, that's the, the nature of it is we don't, re we kind of know what to expect, but then you read articles on people that did not recover. And so it is uh, uh, something that it's a day by day, going through it, being positive, and that's what we've tried to maintain. So that's what I'd like to share with everybody. Still buy local produce. That's, you can get something like this probably from the mainland, maybe not as easily. I don't know, I, I still don't have the answers on mainland produce. If it's shipped here, can it have it? I don't think so. Uh, but you still have to wash your vegetables, your produce, every, you know, this is just a normal practice. I think people are becoming aware of that. It's everyone's responsibility. So that's all I'd like to say.
I, f I forgot to mention that um, I wasn't really paying much attention to you, Dr. Bang, sorry, <laughs> because I was been to all these meetings. But what I don't think people really get is that it attacks your, you, like, it attacks your, your central nervous system, yeah? So it's all your nerves. So, so sometimes you don't feel things. So like, for instance, I walked on a, a concrete um, driveway with some people, some of my friends who were trying to get me over to the grass because my feet were wanting to feel grass because you have different senses, your nerves. Um, and but while, I, while I was walking across barefoot, I didn't realize I was burning the bottom of my feet. And so it's, it's your nerves. Um, I had my hand on the top of the stove one day and I didn't realize that someone had, my, one of my parents just took the, turned the stove off and I put my hand there and I, I didn't realize that my hands were burning. So it, it attacks your, it's, it's all about your nerves, a majority of it. And so it's, it's, it's a whole big thing that, that like my, my dad said, we all learning about it. Um, and like he said, it's like, don't be afraid of buying the local produce. It's about how you wash it and how you slow down and take your time instead of rushing in this rat, literally, the dirty rat world and trying to do things so quickly. Just slow down, wash your produce, and enjoy your meal. So from my family, I, I, I'm thankful for my parents. I, I, I thank for, for to be inviting, to be invited to speak and share my story. Um, so, and I really, really, I, I, I told some folks at the back, um, Takako, my, my friend who had to leave, that every time I come and I see um, the number of people, um, that's the greatest thing. Because when you usually have meetings like this, you only see 10, 15 people. And we gotta get this word out because it's something that's here and we can't stop it right now until we figure it out together. So thank you for letting me and my family share. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm so glad to have the patients come and willing to speak. Um, sometimes Trish is having a hard time speaking and things change, but if you notice she's really smart. She was smart before, she's smart after. But I wanna make the point there's a lot of people who get mental retardation and die, and they're not here to tell their story, and their parents don't want to talk about it. It's too depressing. So remember how horrible it was for her. Some guys, it's, for some other people, it's even worse, okay? But <clears throat> thank goodness, like they said, it, for her, it doesn't seem to have affected her thought process, but it's kind of like a, 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 the luck of the draw. This worm goes on the lining of the brain, that's all the pain and all these weird sensations, but it can go into the brain. And what part it went into the brain? Oh, that's just, God only knows. But a couple worms can kill a kid if it goes into the right centers, like the center for breathing and stuff like that. So this is, I mean, we're, we're glad she's here. And all these weird sensations kind of strike a message, but there's just as much weird sensations for other people that really left them really bad off. So <clears throat> I like the point that she says, we're not trying to scare you, but you know what? The advertiser, a couple of days ago, I rarely read the paper, the editorial was correct. Yeah, we are trying to scare you. Scare you to clean it up in the kitchen. Scare you straight to the kitchen. And this other thing she talked about, take apart these things, wash them carefully. When I was a kid, I don't know, I tried to grow corn, and it was the ugliest ears of corn you ever saw. It looked like every other ear was busted. But my mother made a big deal. You grew this. So when you wash your produce, somebody grew it, especially more if it's grown locally. Somebody put effort into it, and it's your privilege to eat local food. So care for it, enjoy it, look at it, study it. This is not a mass, you know stuff her face and move on to the next thing. So I kind of like this idea of, I don't know, just wash it together, do something, but spend more time cleaning it up, appreciate what it is, because soon it's very hard to grow these things. Now the question is, will the other places on the mainland have it? Rat lung disease is spreading worldwide, 
And you say, well, I didn't hear about it. Yeah, it's spreading over the last 30 years all over the world. The rat is taking the disease all over New Orleans. That's where I did my training. It depends on what slugs are there. If you got the wrong set of slugs, eh, it doesn't spread beyond the rat, and it's low level, but the rats get it from the low level slug. If you got the wrong slug, it can blow up like here. So it's kind of the luck of the draw, what slugs you guys got in your other places. But when that invasive slug comes here, <laughs> you know, we got 26 invasive slugs. This is one of them. Who knows what's going to happen as this spreads across Hawaii, right? OK, now what? Questions, right? So you have questions. I'll try to repeat the question for anybody that's presented yes. Do you think it's safe to eat greens in restaurants? OK, the question is, that's a good question. Do you think it's safe to eat greens in restaurants? You ask that, the tourists ask that. We are trying aggressively to go with all the food establishments, make sure, they're supposed to do this already, but we want to make sure they really know how to do it. So there were some meetings of farmers and producers, but we will meet with the restaurants soon. We are not going to endorse any one restaurant, but we will try to call in five at a time, make a video, play it for everybody, including home people and restaurant people, okay? And yeah, we're, we're trying to step up the restaurant, mostly because the tourists, they have to eat at restaurants sometime, and they want some kind of guarantee that at least the restaurants are aware. Yes, we will do that. Thank you. Yes. Are hydroponics only grown lettuce? Uh, okay. The, the question is hydroponics, stuff that grows on the water. Until further notice, until we get a good look at this, we're going to just wash everything. Besides hydroponics, sorry, they have other germs too. You know, birds pooping on it, stuff in the water, stuff that poops in the water. So just wash it. And you may as well inspect it while you're at it. But in general, there should be a little bit less of that. But when it touches each other, like watercress in Asia, notorious. I mean, you think, oh, that's water. Well, it's enough of a bridge till the slugs cross them. Yes? Um, the video that Sybil B posted, the um, UH Mandela professor, said it's the slug itself you don't want to eat. Okay, the question was, there was a video on Civil Beat, <laughs> Professor Kawi, who talked about the slime of the uh, semi-slug, or slime of slugs. In general, if you get a slug, there's X amount of the germ in the, in the body of the slug. In the slime, there's about 1 50th the amount. So he says the chances of that is lower, okay? But there's also something recent, I think even his lab. They said that when you irritate the slug, chemicals, salty water, vinegar, it puts out a new kind of slime, I don't know, which carries more parasite. So in general, rather than try to second guess, like, well, I saw some slime, but I didn't see slugs, just, just, just wash it. Me, I'm so bad, my vision's so bad, if I see the slime, that means I didn't wash it, and I probably didn't see the slugs too. The, sorry, the slugs? Yes. The, the question is the slime, will it come off with running water? That's why my wife always rinses with vinegar to loosen up the slime. But I told her she probably irritated the slugs. So we have to rinse again with running water, the mechanical force of running water or a brush. If you don't want to do the vinegar, just brush, you can brush off the slime as well. Yes? The salt solution, is it iodized salt, or can you use the Hawaiian rock salt? Oh, it's, it's any kind of salt, but it's a whole lot saltier than the ocean. It's five times as salty as the ocean. If you say, yeah, I would just go put an ocean salt, that'll kill the slug, but it might not kill the parasite for quite a while. And if you slowly kill the slug, I have heard that the parasite can morph into a long stage of hibernation, which will come alive again. So kill the, paras uh, the slug quickly and hold them in that salty solution. Yes? Uh, so after you soak the slug and, and 48 hours in the saline solution, that kills the parasites, kills the slug. What do you do with the water? Can you pour it out or you have to double bag that? Oh, oh, okay, so after you do that slug jug, 
and you kill the thing quickly in the hyper solution, hyper salty solution, what do you do? Well, it's very salty, but it's not infectious. It might, it might stink, and it's not aesthetic. So guys on Big Island are either pouring it in their driver or the, where they want to kill weeds. Okay. <laughs> Somebody asked me, can't you just flush it down the toilet? I, I guess you could, okay? I mean, why not? So if you want to do that, that's fine too. Yes? Yes. Yeah, yeah the, chick, the thing about chickens and ducks, they can eat the slug, they don't get the disease, and they don't pass it on in their poops. I mean, there's a silver lining to the feral chickens. Yes. <laughs> Wait, what is the, the duck? What? Okay, the ratio is one part, one part salt and seven parts fresh water. Now, my wife does it by weight, I do it by volume. It comes out about the same, okay? Wow, what's that? Okay, questions? Uh, yes? Okay, the question is outside, wait, wait, now we, maybe we should say outside of the slug or outside the rat? Okay, so you remember, coming out of the rat, it's in stage, uh, let's just say stage one, maybe it's stage two, no, it's stage one. Coming out of the paras, uh, the slug, it's in stage three. So stage one, how long does it live outside the rat? It's in the rat poop, and in the rat poop, it can live pretty long. I don't know, Fern, what do you think, a week? Fern, help me. But outside the slug, the stage that it infects us, in dry condition, no rain, a few hours. In wet conditions, like water catchment system, uh, kind of a long time. And if it makes its way into a prong, or a freshwater frog, or a freshwater shrimp, long time. But generally, dried air like this, a few hours out of the slug. Yes. Okay, the question is killing the worms in humans. We have some very good worm medicines. They used to be quite inexpensive and they're pretty safe. And outside of the US, we have worm treatment day for the children twice a year. We can kill the worm pretty well, okay? But the minute it comes up into your head, into your meningitis, the docs have to titrate the killing very carefully. If you kill all the worms at once in your head, you'll cause a lot of dead worms, a lot of inflammation, and that inflammation produces so much fluid, you'll trap the brain, and you, we, we always have to tap you out to relieve the pressure. So the docs are controlling the inflammation, maybe, kill, we don't actually kill the worm, the Australians do, but they have to give steroids. Before that, before it gets to your brain, where you got the headache, we would like to kill the worm when it's in your intestine or before it gets to your brain. But people aren't that sick, and so we don't, we don't know who's sick and not until it really gives you that wicked headache, and then it's a little too late to just automatically kill it. So with my dog. Dog, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. The question is, on her dog, there's another medication that can kill the heartworm. That can kill this worm, too. So the dog is taking it regularly for heartworm, and then it happens to, if the dog ate the slug, I'm sure the dog is okay because it's taking the heartworm medication. I gotta check the actual dose on the dog. So why don't we just do that with humans? We cannot take the other medication uh, every day, and furthermore, a three-day course of that medication, I would like a three-day course before it gets to the headache, $6,000. <clears> Online, Canada, $3. <laughs> Read in New York Times why that is. And I'm not joking. Yes. A couple more questions. Sure. Okay, a couple more questions. Yes. 
I understand it's most pervasive from the Hebrew to Kalpo, but have there been rats or slugs or snails or prawns tested in other places of Maui that show positive for the parasite? Okay, the question is, He's worried about East Maui from Nahiku to Kalpo. We actually haven't looked that far yet. We know it's in Hana, but our next job is to look in um, Kipahulu side, a couple, and then Nahiku. We are trying to control, first of all, identify where the semi-slug is, and then if we can, keep it from spreading. It probably spreads through nurseries and plant exchanges. And then the rat keeps moving, but the slug has to be there too to make this hyper, hyper transmission. Yes? When you cook and you go up to 165 degrees, how long uh, does it have to cook at 165 degrees in order to kill the uh, larvae? Good. Lynn, when we get to 100, 165 degrees, how long? Three minutes or something? So what we're saying is that you need to cook to the internal temperature of 165. So similar to when you're doing your turkey, you don't test the outside, you want to test the deepest part to make sure that the whole thing has reached that temperature. So that's what we're looking at. So if you hit that temperature, you should be good. The question is, how do you deal with cooking leafy greens? In terms of cooking it to 165? I guess you just be sure you wash them because the cooking is not really going to add anything. Well, you can. I mean, some people do, like, how many of you eat sukiyaki? Some people eat sukiyaki or, and, and they do add in leafy greens just, just to cook it. But that's more of a saute. So the question is, are you getting to the 165? Probably not. So you do want to make sure that you're rinsing it well. Yeah, 165 is nice. I just want to be sure the larvae is there. Correct. That, that's, what we're, that's what we're trying to get at. So the question is, um, at 165, are we getting killing the larvae? That's what we're trying to get to. OK. Is, is there any circumstance in which the larvae or the parasite in any form can penetrate the vegetables or fruit so you can't wash it? I'm thinking about berries, I'm thinking of apples, I'm thinking of things like that. So you're saying if the, the parasite independent of the slug can, can be no, internalized into the, the produce? Right. Is there any evidence? We don't know. No, probably not. Probably not, but we don't a know. A small slug can go in. You know those bananas I showed you? Yeah, Man, once you see an opening on the banana, this thing can go up, or your papaya, you better track down into that. Yeah. Yeah, apples often have a little wormhole and so forth. So. Yes. So that's a good point. So we, um, not only for this particular parasite, but for other types of um, pathogens, bacteria, if you have damage on your product, that's a point of entry for the pathogen. Okay. So that's why when you when you look in the market, there is this grading system in place. There's a reason because when the Protose is intact, then it's also a way, it's, it's like a protective mechanism from bacteria getting inside. Okay. Uh, you've said you can free. Oh. oh, wait. Does it help to use like vegetable wash? I mean, are there just water? So the question is if using vegetable wash will help with salad greens with, that you're not cooking. So what we do know from the research is that if you're using any kind of um, like a vinegar or other kinds of um, vegetable rinses, it doesn't provide you additional benefit. What works the best is running water and actually friction. So using something like a brush or using your fingers to actually rub the leaves so that you're physically removing what might be on, on your um, feet. We don't, oh God, we don't want the washes to give you a false sense of security. So if you get your vegetable wash and you soak it in, it's not enough. You gotta rinse it. Okay, yes. So if the slug got into the compost, we posed that question and 
And the response was slugs, because the compost does get heated up, will probably not want to stay there. But the, the question is, if the slugs stay there, will the compost pile get um, hot enough to actually kill the pathogen? Most compost piles for the temperature that you're using doesn't get to that kill temperature, but the slugs will probably not be staying in your compost. Okay. Uh, you've said freezing to 15 degrees will kill it, but my freezer doesn't go that low, it goes to 32. Does that do anything or is that not even so a possibility? <laughs> so well, okay, so, so that temperature range was, was the recommendation for the freezings, for okay. that mic. Like, does your freezer make things solid? Can you make ice? Sure. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the, the point for us is to freeze it solid. If you take ice water, which is zero degrees, and you put the slug in there, hey, you're not going to kill anything because it's not, it's got to be solid. Yes. I'm wondering because it's more prevalent in Asia if we're using the same medical treatment protocols as they're using there and if they're doing if they have something that they're doing since they have so much more of it. No, there um, I was living there like seven years or eight years. There's not a big difference. Everyone is a little bit baffled. But the Australians, because it's gone into North Australia, are trying to treat it in the brain before it gets too big and treat it simultaneously with the steroids to control the inflammation. Kind of makes sense. So they'll publish a paper soon on that. Okay, last question. Okay, last question. You know, ro rodent rats are a big part of this whole thing, right? Yeah. My question is, you know, with the demise of the cane, cane yeah. and, and the burning, I'm sure the rat population is going to be increasing tremendously. Okay. What are we going to do about so the question is, rats play into the cycle. When they took out the sugar cane, the rats are going to increase. And so how is that going to affect the cycle? We're not sure. But you will see a lot of effort besides the slugs. We're talking about slugs because not people don't know about it. But we surely know about the rat. So Kalani English is amassing a monstrous amount of rat traps. And at the Hana festival, but they're like giving away, or we got to control the rat. More than just this disease, leptospirosis, oh, good, good grief, you know, and all that. So you are correct. We will address the rats as best we can, hoping that will affect the cycle. We don't promise, right? Because on the big island, when they catch the rat, they're all hyper infected. So let's say you have 10 rats and you kill nine, but that one might be enough to keep all the slugs infected. So we don't know how plastic the cycle is by affecting the number of rats, because it's so infected. Good, okay, we'll be around if you have questions. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you.